Okay, we're recording. All right, welcome. Thank you. Welcome back or welcome for the first time. This is the UWGB Summer Series Technology in Context by the Austin E. Conference School of Business and Advancing Digital. Um, my name is Oliver Buxa. I am the executive in residence for the Conference School of Business. and I also have my own uh, business, Advancing Digital. Um, the idea of this year's summer series is to first ground you in fundamentals of new technologies. We are in the fourth session today. I'm going to give a quick recap of the first three, and then we're going to dive into the many faces of robots in the future. We have one more foundation uh, to set uh, next week, the cutting edge of new technologies, uh, really sort of going on the periphery, things you probably have not heard as much about. And then we're going to switch into the second half of our series, and we're going to look at how these technologies are impacting key themes times. So with that, here's sort of a recap. Uh, maybe some of you have attended all the prior sessions. Uh, maybe some of you have not. So let me catch you up. In the first session, we talked about how a digital world is forming, is being created that increasingly mirrors at least the man-made portion of the real world. And the reason for that is that almost every device, every building, every car, everything that moves now has some component of digital technology in it to capture data, to transmit data, uh, to analyze data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I liken it sometimes to the movie Tron, right, where there was a, a digital universe, but it's not quite um, as fancy. Um, and this digital world is becoming more and more capable. And the reason that it is more capable is that more human-like technologies are being developed. Sensory technologies like facial recognition, emotion recognition, communication technologies like natural language understanding and natural language production, cognitive technologies like AI, artificial intelligence, expert systems, knowledge elements, um, access to vast inventories of knowledge. And if you tie these individual technologies together, you can build intelligent systems. So we are having a, a, a very dense digital world, a very connected digital world, and that world is becoming more and more capable. In the third session last week, we primarily focused on how we will interact with that world. Um, from the old days of uh, punch cards, whoops, I have a blackout. Can you guys still see my computer? Yes, I went away for a second, but now it's back. Okay, I don't know what happened here. Um, so uh, from, from the old days of punch cards to communicate with machines, we are now moving to very natural styles of conversation, um, natural language, visual perception. So it will feel very uh, natural, very human-like to us. And today, uh, in the fourth session, I want to talk about what I call empowered machines. The most noticeable representation of that digital world in our physical world will be robots, because the robots have a physical body. They are living in our world, but they are obviously connected. They are, in a way, an interface to the digital world as well. And so what are we going to cover today? I want to give you a little bit of context. You know, where does this idea of robots come from? What actually is a robot and how is it evolving? Uh, then we're going to talk about the many ways in which robots are going to be um, in our lives. Uh, I'll show you various applications. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about robots as part of our social fabric, uh, maybe becoming parts of our of our families uh, even. And ultimately, I'm going to raise a couple of uh, red flags, cautions that we have to address when it comes to this topic. So let's dive in here. Uh, when you hear the word robot, a lot of different things might come to mind from the Mars rover, maybe Transformers or Pacific Rim, these giant robots that fight aliens, um, little robots that are programmable. I know UWGB has something similar to the one on the bottom left, I've seen it in action, industrial robots that don't have a face, but they can perform certain movements or even alien looking, you know, creatures or Lego robots or whatever else is out there. 
And so where does that word come from? Um, it's a Czech word, and it actually means forced labor, right? Um, there was a play, a stage play in 1921. And in that stage play, the, the, the robots were actually not mechanized. They were made from a chemical batter and they were just more efficient than humans. So that idea was already there. Ultimately, they turned evil. And maybe that's where this whole theme of evil robots taking over the world and turning against their creator um, got its original tone from. The idea of having a machine that can do something on its own actually goes back surprisingly far. In 1200, Al Jazari, um, who uh, was a, a, an engineer uh, in the Middle East, uh, wrote an entire book about machines. And he had, for example, a set of machines that could float on the water and the movement of the, of the water the current itself basically created momentum in, within those machines. And then through um, a mechanism, they would be playing music. So for the time, this was a, a remarkable achievement. Leonardo da Vinci, of course, also thought about it. You know, how could you build um, an automated knight, uh, somebody who maybe moves or even fights um, on his own? So he had some detailed drawings on that. This is obviously pre-electricity, right? So you'd have to, you'd have to design a mechanism uh, through which you wind up this night, and then you see the little turn thing there, and then it can perform. Uh, in this case, it looks like it's actually just drumming. So maybe the, the robot can drum so that the, the men can fight. Um, so some key questions that come to mind here. When is it a robot? And when is it a machine? And would we only call it a robot if it's more human-like, if it's like an Android looking thing, or does it have to be lifelike, or could anything be? And what are the critical skills? What does it need to have? We talked earlier about interface technologies, communication technologies, cognitive capabilities, independence, right? So what, what are really the characteristics? What makes something a robot? A lot of times when I talk about this, people bring up or they, they raise their hand and say, oh, you know, isn't it defined in, in the three laws of robotics? Uh, so this is from a from a story by Isaac Asimov, who is a really accomplished science fiction writer. And uh, this was also featured in the movie iRobot. Um, but these three laws of robotics are completely fictional. So Asimov made them up. These are not real laws of robotics, right? Um, the, the machine um, may not harm uh, the creator, the human being. It must obey the orders and it must protect itself unless it you know, conflicts with the first and second law. So this is fictional. This is not real. So let's look, look at real definitions. Um, Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. They say a robot is autonomous, capable of sensing in the environment, carrying out computations, making decisions, and then performing actions. So it is a cycle, right? Sensory capabilities, acting on that data, coming to a conclusion, to a decision, and then performing an action. So a machine that is just plugged in, that does what it is programmed to do, that's not a robot because it is not sensing in the environment. It just keeps doing what it is programmed to do. Um, Wikipedia, a little bit more... Um, elaborate, um, complex series of actions. So they're basically saying it can just be one simple thing. If it can only do one simple thing, it's not a robot. And uh, they also make a mention here of the design. Right? Is the design is related to its performance of a task with no regard to the aesthetic. So there's no requirement that a robot has to be pretty. So here's a, a little test then. Is a thermostat a robot? It can sense, it can perform, albeit limited actions. It can regulate the temperature. It has a, you know, a small algorithm that says if it's too cold, uh, you know, put in more heat. If if it's too warm, stop working. Right. It probably doesn't meet all the criteria. So, for example, it cannot really communicate. Right. But what if we looked at a more modern version of the thermostat? You know, I don't know if this is Nest or Ring or something like that. Um, but if this system can now tell me whether it's too hot or too cold in my 
house or whether the temperature is changing suddenly, right? Now it all of a sudden it has the ability to communicate. It can self-regulate potentially if I've set certain parameters. It has external and internal controls. It monitors the outside temperature and adjusts what it needs to do inside the house to prepare for that. So it is approaching the qualifications of a robot. And we'll talk later about the smart home as a livable robot. So in my view, what makes a robot a robot? Number one, carry out complex or repetitive tasks with little, if any, direction by a human, right? So if, if it requires constant supervision, then that to me is not uh, a robot. That's a machine that I hold like my saw or my, my drill. And it responds to the environment autonomously to alter its program and complete a task and know when the task is complete. So there has to be the ability to perceive, the ability to compute, and the ability to sort of conclude when something is done. The robot should not be just you know, keep churning, keep working forever until it is turned off. So here is what many consider the first real example of a robot, uh, IBM, uh, sorry, SRI, uh, designed it in 1960, and they called it shaky because probably it was a little shaky as it was moving around, but it had perception capabilities. It had a camera and bump sensors. It could navigate a complex environment moving through an office complex. It was slow. It was awkward. It was twitchy. Oftentimes didn't work, but it was sort of, you know, the first time that somebody had put all these elements into a functioning entity. So shaky may have been the first robot. On the industrial side, the um, 1961 General Motors Unimate is considered the first robot. And th th a theme emerges here that early robots were mainly designed to perform work that was too hard, too heavy, or too dangerous for humans to perform. So you didn't want humans to, to break their back or burn themselves. So this robot was working with hot die casts and perform welding uh, operations. Um, from my childhood, I had something very similar to this one. You could you could turn it on and it would just walk straight and then it would look around and you know it could actually turn itself a little bit and, and keep walking. We had a lot of fun imagining uh, this what this little space robot could do, but it would probably not meet all the requirements of a real robot because the only task it could do was walk. Maybe it could say a thing or two. Um, but then, you know, through science fiction, through folklore, or through real world applications, the idea of what a robot could be really uh, proliferated. So if you look across this chart, you'll probably see many of your favorites. Uh, and some of them are hybrid human robots, and, and others are cute little machines. But um, all our favorite characters from science fiction are on here. So let's take a look at the evolution of robots. Uh, and there's there's two things. The first one is that these robots are becoming more and more complex in what they do. Um, I'm not, not confident enough that in this team's environment here, we can actually play videos. I've done it in live sessions. Um, I don't want to get you know, all twitchy and get the connection boggled up, but you see uh, some links on the bottom. and. If you look up Boston Dynamics, um, there's multiple videos on their website. This little dog can walk around. They have a video of it dancing, doing somersaults. Atlas, the tall uh, stand-up ro robot, can run, can jump. I've seen it scale a building, the outside of a building in real time. So if ever there's going to be police robots, military robots, or the kind of robots that hunt down humans, they're likely going to come first from Boston Dynamics. This is sort of the what Teradyne was in the Terminator is Boston Dynamics. And there's a lot of military funding behind their developments. Um, the other dimension is that the use cases for robots are you know, widening more and more. Um, just last weekend, we went to breakfast on the farm and in the, in the you know, cow barn, there was a robot that kept going up and down the aisles and, and pushing the feed back to the cows um, as they were pushing it back into the into the walkway. So that robot just had one simple task to push the feed in. So let's take a look at 
a range of uh, robots in, in today's reality here. This is sort of the old version of industrial robots, right? Uh, they were programmed, they could actually sense where is the part. So they, they were not programmed to pick up the part at a microscopically defined space, but they could actually sense where is the part, grab it appropriately, do something with it, move it over, maybe you know, put a weld on it or something like that. But they were dangerous. They were caged away from humans um, because they, they did not necessarily realize if a human was approaching. If they swing around and you're behind it, you get knocked in the head. Um, the next generation of robots that people also refer to as cobots is very different. These robots actually sense the presence of the human. Um, if you touch them, they pull back. They stop what they're doing. Uh, and then they, when you know, they they feel safe, they resume it um, either based on visual cues or uh, the next generation of cobots is also going to follow verbal commands. This one is mounted stationary, so the human and the robot are working together using the best skills. Maybe the robot is better for certain, you know, precision tasks, and and the human for supervision, quality control, whatever the task sharing is. The human and the robot are working together. Um, there are mobile units as well, so you could see in a, in a car manufacturing environment, um, the robot could be the assistant to the human, handing him different types of parts or tools or whatever, and, and then the human um, assembles, uh, the car takes the next step, or maybe in some cases it's the opposite, where the human hands the car and the robot, if the car is maybe heavier, the robot welds it and screws it on. Uh, in agriculture, we have robots. Um, this is an example where the, the tractor itself is not necessarily the robot, but the equipment that's behind. It has a bunch of sensors, it has cameras. Uh, those cameras can identify weeds, can differentiate the weeds from the plants, and then they apply a micro dose of pesticide only to the weeds, not to the plants. So they don't have to spray the entire field with pesticides. It saves obviously a lot of money uh, and a lot of ecological impact. Um, these are other robots. Uh, they may have a higher degree of autonomy because there's no driver involved anymore. They are GPS controlled. They roam the field or you know move up and down the field and perform different tasks. Uh, one of the benefits of using smaller robots is that you get far less soil compression, which is a big deal in agriculture and, and maintaining soil health. Uh, one company has taken this to the next level, the small robot company from Great Britain. They have three robots, Tom, Dick, and Harry, of course, British humor, right? So Tom is a monitoring robot. Tom basically roams the farm. It has GPS coordinates of the farm's environment. And Tom uh, you know, wakes up in the morning, drives around, and surveys the land. How dry is the land? What do the pictures of the crop growth tell him about, uh, you know, fertility of the soil, maybe the need to add uh, certain nutrients. You could combine this also with a drone. A drone is obviously more efficient in moving um, around the environment. And so this, this guy can do 20 hectares per day, <clears throat> which is a pretty significant amount. And who is to say that you only have one of those, right? But equipping the farmer with uh, very current data on how his crops, how his soil, uh, how his, his watering needs are doing out there. That's the purpose of Tom. Um, Dick is a different robot. Dick goes out, recognizes weeds, similar to the bigger system we saw earlier, only that Dick is autonomous, and it does not use any chemicals at all. It uses a an electric zapping system to basically uh, kill the weeds. So it, it puts a needle into the base of the weed and gives it a high voltage which kills the weed. So this could be chemical-free weeding without human intervention. And again, robots can essentially work um, as long as there's daylight, or if you're willing to put some light sources on it, they can work at night as well. And then they have a third one, Harry, which is a precision planting machine. So Harry can is also GPS controlled, but, but to a very, very precise level. And so you could use Harry to interplant different seeds because it would remember exactly where the other seeds are. Uh, were placed. So this is example. These are examples of a new style of agriculture where we no longer have massive machines roaming the soil, 
but we have a swarm of little machines performing uh, the, the essential tasks in agriculture, and all of that is controlled from a central unit, um, you know, call it AI, um, that basically coordinates the actions of these robots. Um, here's another uh, farming system, and this is an indoor farming system called Iron Ox. Uh, again, you see the camera, you see the grabber, right? So this, this farming system basically cultivates indoor uh, plants. And uh, from what I understand, it can do almost everything. It can monitor, it can supervise, it can water, it can fertilize. Only the, the planting part is still a little too delicate for a robot to handle it. So they still need humans to actually put the, the tiny little seedlings in. And then um, for some reason, the packaging of the lettuce uh, also seems to still need human intervention. Maybe it's you know taken off the outer leaves or whatever it is to make it look uh, pretty. But we could have at some point almost fully autonomous indoor growing environments. And that could supplement traditional agriculture because we could be growing our food here 12 months a year. 24-7, uh, artificial lighting, um, and so forth. Um, this is now not really agriculture, but it's considered a household robot, uh, a lawnmower. And if you recall, last week we talked about interface technologies, right? This robot is working autonomously. It has a charging station. You essentially put stakes in your lawn that mark the periphery that the robot should mow. And then it sort of, you know, it follows that virtual map. It goes zigzag, crisscross. It doesn't go neatly back and forth like a good German robot would. Um, but it gets the job done. And when it feels it's it's out of battery or low on battery, it returns to its charging stations, docks back in, charges up, and then it goes back out there. Um, this robot doesn't talk. It doesn't speak. It's it's sort of a dumb garden servant. However, there's no reason to believe you could not change the interface. Um, I could equip this robot with the ability, for example, to mow a labyrinth into my lawn if I have a large enough lawn, and then I could follow the robot. I could program this robot to be an expert system to give me, you know, like Master Shifu or Socrates to give me important lessons while I wander through the labyrinth, essentially following my robot. Uh, so we conceive of, of machines today in a, in a very functional sense, but the principal ability to equip them with other cognitive and sensory uh, capabilities already exists. It's just a matter of adding a camera, a speaker, and the, the you know the microprocessors, and then of course the software that allows them to operate. Uh, Roomba or the many other indoor vacuum um, cleaners, autonomous vacuum cleaners are another example. They also now have window cleaning robots that can do the vertical. Uh, job and so forth. So we're going to have these quiet or maybe at some point even entertaining and communicative household devices that take away some of our chores. Package delivery. I've seen one of those cross the street in, in Madison. Uh, Amazon is testing different delivery models. They've already got their own trucks now and maybe in some neighborhoods we will see the truck pull up and then five or six of these little guys roll out of the truck and they go to the to the houses and they drop off the packages and um, or maybe for certain express deliveries from a nearby warehouse straight down the, the road, uh, we might see these robots fulfill some of the delivery tasks. Uh, Amazon has greater plans. Um, they want to have a, an autonomous delivery system where big um, blips are in the sky uh, holding high frequency items and then the drones basically drop out of those blips and deliver um, the the packages directly to uh, the, the people below. Uh, it's almost like a scene from Space Invaders. Um, so they have the patent whether or not they've actually built it or planning to build it. They're very coy um, about that. But I, I would not put it past Jeff Bezos to actually put this into reality. Here's another example, a, a robotic bartender. And again, this could be a fairly, uh, you know, dumb machine where you just say, you know, give me a white Russian and boom, it goes, it gets the milk and it puts in the, whatever the black stuff is that goes into the, into the drink and it mixes your drink with high precision. You always get exactly the same quality. It knows how to stir, it knows how to shake and so forth. But you could also give this a different interface. You could make this thing more human-like. 
I remember there was a science fiction movie where people were supposed to be asleep for 100 years, but one of the guys woke up and the only guy he had to talk to was the robotic waiter, right? So they became friends. Um, there's no reason to not make these things intelligent and communicative because that's probably one of the reasons why people go to a bar, not just to consume alcohol, but also to be social. Um, robots in restaurants, uh, bringing you the food, maybe taking your order, maybe recognizing you and having a conversation. Oh, you know, I remember you were here a few weeks ago, or I remember, I don't remember, but my counterpart remembers you from, uh, you know, 100 miles away because we're part of the same chain. And so I already know what you like to order. And I realize you don't have your kids here today, or if the kids are there, actually engage the kids in a conversation. And as freaky as that may seem to, to me and some of us, um, my kids would totally love that. I could not get them to go to a restaurant that doesn't have a robot if there was one that did have one. Um, this is real. Robot Concierge Hotel EMC2 in Chicago. Um, they bring little things to the room so the, the staff no longer has to do that. You forgot your toothpaste. They send one of these little guys up to bring you your toothpaste. Um, in the educational environment, you know, either as um, sort of um, an assistant teacher who is not physically present or as an expert system that you can communicate with or to teach, you know, programming languages. Again, the, the, the spectrum is going to be, are these just little toys for entertainment purposes or do these things have all the qualities that we described earlier? They can sense, they can collect information, they have a, a knowledge database against which they can poll, they can make a decision, they can give an answer, and voila, you've got a teacher's assistant at some level, right, that can, that can uh, entertain, can observe, uh, can contribute to the education process in the classroom. Um, I mentioned earlier the intelligent home. Now, we don't think of our house as a robot, mostly because we live inside of it. But once a house is equipped with cameras, with thermostats, um, with you know security alarms and all the windows, uh, maybe with automated light switches, uh, every electrical device can be switched on and off by the central uh, unit. Over time, the house actually learns your preferences, so it, it builds memory, it gets to know you, and all those little things that, you know, coming home, having to turn on the light, having to turn on the heat, da da da, da the house does all of that for you. Uh, maybe you even give it a verbal interface, so the house communicates with you in your preferred language, asks you, um, what music you'd like to listen to if you want to watch your favorite show because it's that time of the week and that time of the night and, and so forth. So we could be living inside of something that meets all the requirements of being a robot. And then we have robots um, that could be lifesavers. Uh, this little snake robot, for example, it can crawl into rubble. It can spot survivors. If you think about that, building collapse in Florida right now, they're stopping the work right now because it's too dangerous. The, the rest of the structure could collapse. But what if there is a survivor uh, in there and we don't know? Uh, this little thing is very mobile. It could crawl into small crevices and then you know take pictures, maybe even deliver some emergency medicine, pain, whatever. Or larger robots that can pick up a soldier and carry the soldier off the battlefield as opposed to sending a medic out there who then might get shot as well. So then you have two casualties. So there's no limitation on the purposes of robots because, as we mentioned, the mechanical capabilities, the shapes that they can take on are ever increasing, and the sensory, the communication, the cognitive capabilities are ever increasing as well. So let me pause here for a moment and see if there are any questions about what we've covered so far. Nobody has any questions about robots. Are you guys still there? Catherine, are you still there? 
I'm yeah, here on water. Like an especially quiet okay, good, today. good. <laughs> I just got, I just freaked out for a moment. Maybe I was talking to the ether for 20 minutes. <laughs> All right. I, I agree with you, Oliver, though, with the robotic that you, or the robot that you sh showed, it could be an excellent application to the building in Florida that was, that has collapsed. Right. Yeah, um, you know, right now we have some robots that are available for us in the in the retail world. Most of them are still a little expensive, so they they are commercial applications. Um, there's a bank in New York that is experimenting with a robot, where the robot basically welcomes the people and guides them around. I think I've shown a picture in one of the previous sessions. And there, it's not so much about the functional skills of the robot. It's basically just to give it a body, make it a cute token, and people come in, take pictures with it, and it gives the bank a cool feel, right? So um, just like we designed AI systems uh, in, in one of our earlier sessions, you could essentially say, hey, what robot would I want to have at home? Um, do I want to go as far as, you know, Robin Williams in Bicentennial Man, a uh, uh, Android looking thing that can learn everything about my family, can do household chores, can communicate with me, um, or am I okay with staying at the Roomba level? You know, pick up the crumbs and don't tell anyone what you found. That's good enough for me. Oliver, I was watching uh, something, I think last night, um, and I, I get, you know, your question about what is a robot and what isn't, and they were really talking about the use of autonomous vehicles to take over a good mm -hmm. chunk of like the excavating and the construction process where, you know, you'd have backhoes and bulldozers and all this, you, know, you, you feed in the, the LIDAR map of the, of the site and, and the schematics, and then you, you set them loose and you come back in a few days or whatever, and the whole dug and everything's ready to go, right. For the, the foundation. So like the idea that what we consider a vehicle now, you know, with the sensors and the, the AI component laid on top of it, what it could actually Sort of be transformed into that definition of a robot, you know, is kind of an intriguing thought to me that I hadn't thought about before. Yep, and and there's there's really again a continuum, right? So in construction, you might have vehicles that are remote controlled, so that the humans don't need to be sort of in the field of danger. Or in agriculture, you could have the same thing. In military, obviously, there's the big debate about drones: should they be remote controlled, or do we set them free to pursue the target on their own? And 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 you know execute the kill order, and then there is the true robot uh, that is not remote control. That is actually you know sort of understanding the tasks that are involved in laying a foundation or building a wall or tearing down uh, a property and cleaning up the mess. And they will know when it looks like it's done, and and then they move on to the next one, right? Uh, so. We're going to see this uh, everywhere. And one of the questions, obviously, is if robots can do all these things in the future at a fairly good, reliable level, what happens to all the people who used to do those things, right? And there's two schools of thought. The one school says, please take away all these mundane, hurtful, physical tasks from us uh, so we can focus our time on higher value added, uh, customer service, communication, planning, et cetera, et cetera. But how many people do you need to do that? You know, do you really need the army of thousands and thousands? There is a robot called Flippy that can flip burgers. Uh, we've seen the other robot that can serve the food, right? So what if we had a robotic restaurant in which every task is performed by a robot? Now that puts 20 um, workers out of a job because these robots can actually work all three shifts, right? We don't even think about that. It's not like we need three sets of these robots. And so there's a there's a big question mark behind automation, and I'll come back to that uh, when we talk about uh, individual and organizational decisions. Oliver, uh, yes, uh, we believe I've seen a study that was I think from Japan, where they've found that um, robots seem to be particularly vulnerable especially when alone, and if they're humanoid looking, to being vandalized or tortured by humans, um, and that we don't have the same regard for them as we would a human doing that thing out in the mall, or that we would for a non-humanoid looking machine doing that thing. Hmm. I, I, had not, I had not heard that before. Um, 
I in, in, in past presentations, I shared a couple of slides of sort of human like robots and I have a few coming here. Um, but, you know, I could see the resentment, right? Um, people vandalize everything. Every time somebody feels like they're not supervised, right, they tend to vandalize. I, I see the messages on Nextdoor all the time where people say, my mailbox got vandalized, my driveway got vandalized, these teens are tearing up the neighborhood. So yeah, it doesn't shock me, right? It and tended to be, I think it, to some extent, it did tend to be kids seeing, you know, whether they could pull an arm off or right. what would happen if they would knock it over, you know, things like that. Right. Yeah. So may, maybe they are more vulnerable. Now, the good news is um, that they can be fixed, right? But I, I think, you know, as, and I'll get into that a little bit, um, as robots become more ubiquitous, I think our relationship to the robots is going to change, right? Today, we clearly look at them as a device, as a machine. But the more they take on these communication capabilities and memory and they get to know us, I think that that perception, that notion is going to shift. I really love the movie Bicentennial Man with Robin Williams, how he becomes more and more human-like and you know, right after his death basically earns the designation of, of a human being, right? So let's take a look at these um, social aspects of robots. So this is not a new slide. I've shown this before, right? Childhood companion robots. Uh, they can sense, they can communicate. Uh, whether they can do a whole lot of physical actions, I don't know. Maybe they can give a hug or, or they can cuddle. Probably it's going to be more at the cognitive level, but they could be a childhood companion uh, there for safety, uh, alert functions, you know, any stranger approaches the child, the robot could send off an alarm uh, and so forth. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we've talked about this as well, elder care, uh, social engagement, intellectual engagement, pe keeping, keeping people's brains active, uh, physical assistance with care in the home. So there's a wide range of tasks that where robots could play a critical role. And you mentioned is really a pioneer in leveraging robots because they have this demographic challenge. They just don't have enough young people to take care of, of all the older people and perform all the other jobs in the economy. So they're using robots on both ends to supplement the labor force on the industrial side and to explore um, these social functions of robots. This is the this is the image I was talking about the lifelike human, um, for example, as a as a hotel concierge, uh, you know, and and maybe these robots will get vandalized more, um, you know, because it's like a, a mannequin that's moving around. Let's see if we can you know kick it or or tip it over or something like that. But again, the the quality of interaction is becoming more and more lifelike. And this is uh, an example, Sophia the robot. Uh, here, the developers focus primarily on the facial expressions. So Sophia has a lot of mechanical parts that can mimic uh, facial expressions, just like we use different muscles to move our eyebrows, to express surpri surprise or anger or whatever. Uh, and so she can do that. Now, they made some very deliberate decisions. They did not, uh, while the face is very human-like and the upper body, the, the, the chassis is a, uh, looks just like a, a robot on wheels, and they've left the brain uncovered here to, to really draw the distinction. This is not a human, but it is a machine with human-like capabilities. And um, again, in, in sort of um, in playing on sci-fi uh, movies, Sophia actually was designated by the, uh, by, I believe it's, um, Saudi Arabia, they recognized her as a, as a citizen. Um, now, if you take this a level further now, if robots can be so human-like, um, you know, at what point do they reach the status of being a companion alternative? We already have uh, sex robots, essentially, with limited capabilities. Maybe they can make certain noises or say certain things. But again, as the mobility functions improve, as facial expression improves, as language understanding improves, I could see how at some point the quality of the interaction with that robot is not just a sex toy. 
Uh, it could be conversation. It could be, you know, let's go for a walk. Uh, how was your day? And uh, people who have traumatic relationship experiences, they may prefer uh, to have someone that they can actually determine. They can determine the level of humor and the type of humor um, uh, and so forth. There is a, a trend already beginning in Japan that people are choosing non-human relationships, not just with physical machines, but also with virtual characters. And so I think that is on the horizon and we're going to have to uh, ask some questions as to, you know, what is the status? What if somebody has a non-human companion? Are we going to give that companion any level of protections? Could they inherit the fortune of this person? Like some pets already today can inherit um, the fortune of a person and then a trustee basically takes care of the, of the pet in the future. So lots of questions, but they all go back to the increasing evolution of human-like features and capabilities in those machines. So risk of companion robots, obviously um, we don't really develop social skills anymore because we can just program our partner to be how we need them to be or we want them to be. Um, we don't form lasting relationships with other humans anymore, fewer marriages, fewer partnerships, fewer children. And that ultimately leads to unstable population levels, right? So maybe Japan is amplifying their problem by embracing robots in the way they are. Um, now, on the flip side, you could say maybe this is, you know, part of a marriage or it might actually help abuse and acting out on sexual frustrations. Um, so it's all to be seen. We're in the earliest, earliest stages. There's no laws really yet. There's no ethical guidelines around this, but the technology, once again, is sort of racing away from us on, on that dimension. So here are a few things I want you to think about. So as an individual, right, let's, let's just, um, Catherine, can you do a quick time check? What time do we have right now? It is 1244, so we've got about 15 minutes left. Okay, so we've got time, right? So let, let's let's actually engage in that exercise, right? If you have the financial resources, let's say that's not a problem, or you get a grant, you get to buy yourself a robot as part of a research study, and you get to take that robot home, right? What would you be comfortable with? A robot that mows your lawn, a robot that vacuums your floor, uh, a robot that protects your home, um, or a robot that does household chores, that looks more human-like, that moves around the house, that sees what you're doing, that engages with your kids. Um, where would be your comfort level? If you, if you were offered to design a robot for your personal use, what robot would you design and, and order? Who has, a, who has a view on that? Oliver, this is Mike. I have one. <clears throat> I I designed a robot that uh, would be able to do some of the household chores, accompany me outdoors as I uh, do some out some things outdoors. Uh, when I when I leave and go on vacation, I'd like them to take care of the dog, make sure the cat is fed, let the mm -hmm. dog out, monitor the location of the dog so they're not wandering off. Um, some of the functions that currently, you know, limit what I can do. How would you want to communicate with a robot in natural language or certain menus where you kind of click on your phone, take feed the cat, take out the dog? What would be your comfort level on communicating? I'd like to speak in a natural language to the robot. Mm -hmm. uh, give it some basic instructions, you know, feed the cat at this time and this time. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, if the cat still has food, don't give it as much. Um, okay. Check on the dogs at these times. Make sure that they go outside, get some exercise, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, how do you envision your robot looking? Is it sort of a bipedal humanoid or is it just a, a little machine that can get through the through the doggy door? Or how do you envision your robot to look? I would prefer one that would look a little more human that I would feel if, as I'm interacting with the with the robot that 
it would have the ability to communicate with me and I could have a conversation with it. Okay. Now, would you want the robot to learn your habits so that it knows, yep, the cat needs to be fed every day at 11 and the dog needs to be walked three times? Or would you want it to be responsive only to specific commands? Um, I'd like it to learn. Uh, that way it could change the, or clean out the litter box too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, right? And and sort of it becomes, that's what we refer to as sort of an, an ambient environment, right? You don't even have to say anything anymore. The robot, the house, the machine has essentially learned what it needs to do, and it just does it. People who have a Roomba, they don't worry about crumbs anymore because there's never any more crumbs. The Roomba just takes care of it. Who else has an idea on, on what kind of, kind of robot they would want to take home? So I would want a robot primarily to interact with my kids, right? Because the kids are so uh, screen oriented, you know, they always want to watch TV or go on the iPad, et cetera, et cetera. But that's one way communication. You know, you choose the show and then it's information is flowing your way. I would much rather see something where they get engaged, where maybe the robot asks them questions and the robot can monitor what they're doing the tv doesn't see what my kids are doing but the robot would see and i could maybe see it through the robot's eyes what my kids are up to so that would be the biggest uh, value added for me to sort of contribute to the intellectual development and at the same time the the, the safety um, of my kids all right so the second consideration is since most of us are not going to be in a position to afford very fancy robots but our employers might, right? Our employers might have a robot that whacks the floors or uh, a, a cognitive robot that replaces the receptionist and, and you know, calls people uh, if visitors are coming or, you know, the concierge robot, et cetera, et cetera. So those of you who are leading organizations or departments, you know, Matt, I'll call on you if you're still there. Um, what are your thoughts on sort of defining the boundaries, you know, which human activity is OK to be replaced and, and where would you um, be cautious? And do you think it's going to be driven by efficiencies? We just have to save money so we can use it for better purposes. Or do you think at some point your students, your, your customers essentially will expect an interaction with a machine, with a robot? What, what are your thoughts there? Uh, I hate to sound like a cliche, but I, like I, I, I keep thinking the market's going to kind of decide this. I was speaking with a, a CEO this week of a, one of the major healthcare providers in the area, and it's not exactly a robot, but it's kind of that AI interface robot thing, right? What is a robot? And they mm -hmm. said they they added the the capacity to do you know sort of um, online scheduling or something, which sounds you know, mm -hmm. kind of simple, but they found out that some huge chunk, like 20, 30 percent of their appointments were made during the hours that they had traditionally been closed. So that flexibility that, you know, robots and so forth that don't have that work schedule can provide, it's going to be hard to overcome. And especially mm -hmm. as we start to think about the, the, you know, those industrial robots, those are big and expensive and heavy. But as you move more towards these smaller um uh, you know, more sort of like uh, computer chip-based robots, so for the microbots, the cost for those is going to sort of exponentially decrease through time, like really quickly, right? So from an economic standpoint, I, I think that's going to really be hard to, um, to ignore. I think you're going to be forced into it. So the question for me is, in which functions will I choose to retain as a robot versus a uh, you know, a, a, a person, but what type of societal um, norms will we adopt or not adopt that will mm -hmm. shape the way those decisions are made? Because the ubiquitous, the ubiquity with which these technologies can be applied across broad spectrums of the economy seems so different than what the way technology has interfaced in the past. Right. So I guess that's a non-answer, Oliver, but that is how yeah. I think about it. Right. 
And, you know, um, take Amazon as an example, right? They decided to automate their warehouses, right? And at first blush, they were eliminating 85% of the activity being performed in their warehouses, now all being done by machine. But because they achieved such a high efficiency with that, and they could offer now uh, basically free shipping and could sell everything at lower prices, Amazon's growth exploded so that Amazon actually never had to lay off any worker. They just kept on adding and adding and adding, of course, at the expense of workers at Sears and JCPenney and other, right? So people did lose their jobs, but not within the company, right? So there's another function to think about. Are we able, through the use of automated labor, uh, to differentiate ourselves, which then is going to contribute to our success, or do we play it safe and somebody else does that, and then we are in the defensive and we're going to have to fight for our survival because we can just never achieve their efficiency, their quality, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So these are just big decisions we're going to have to think about. And you mentioned societal norms, right? So here's a chart about adoption of industrial robots. Now, these are the old, you know, caged machines. And boy, Japan is just way ahead of everybody else uh, on that front. And it was mainly driven by the need to do that because they just didn't have the workers. If they wanted to build cars in Japan, they had no choice. They had to automate the labor. But now think about that, right? Their level is three and a half times that of the US. It's you know almost 10 times that of the rest of the Americas. If you just think about, this is old school automation, right? If, if there is a, like a, a 80, 90% growth embedded in, in old school automation, and then you overlay that with all the new tasks that robots can do, I think it's gonna come down to the pace, right? Um, if these robotic activities are going to be adopted relatively quickly, there is going to be a dip in employment because we can't invent new tasks and build new economies fast enough. If it's going to be a little bit slower, yeah, then maybe we can uh, we can we can cushion that. But so many new laws, rules, ethical guidelines, norms will have to be um, established. What if the robot makes a mistake? who's liable, right? Is it the person employing the robot or is it the company that built the robot or is it the engineer that programmed uh, the robot? So many questions are related to that. You know, Oliver, the, the other thing, yes. if you can go back for just a second, that Absolutely. last slide, that's interesting about that, at least at, at surface value, you know, that, that choice for Japan doesn't appear to be driven purely by economics, right? Because otherwise there wouldn't be auto industries in other countries or whatever, right? So right. that was in part a cultural choice, right? They could have imported, they could have changed their immigration policies to allow workers in to build cars as an alternative, right? But culturally, <laughs> not necessarily economically, they, they chose to go the robot way, right? And maintain the existing immigration policies, right? So again, it's gonna, that the, the cultural choices we make I think are going to be really a big part of how all this plays out, not necessarily just the pure economic element. Right. Yeah. And if you look at the, at the Japanese uh, pop culture, right. Uh, almost like power Rangers and, and a lot of these other comics, uh, they very explicitly feature robots and the interactions of human and robots. And they have done so for decades before these things became popular uh, here with us, right? So it's not a shocker to me that if you want to know where sort of, you know, what's it gonna look like 10 years from now here, we'll go to Japan now and look at all the applications of robots that you're gonna find over there. And their societal acceptance for that is already much higher because uh, you get used to it. Just like, you know, the first time I went to McDonald's and there was this, you know, make your order here on the digital display, I'm like, why would I do that? The person down there has no customers, so I just bypass it, right? And and now it's like, you know, I really want to make sure that that order is exactly as I want it. So minus mayo plus ranch, right? And I maybe she still doesn't understand what I'm saying, but I'm going to do it on the digital display now. And it gives me a higher reliance that I get exactly what I want. I've accepted it now as part of the process where first I was rebelling against it, right? Any other questions for the for the good of the order before we close shop here for today? 
However, one thought that has come to mind during this discussion is the future of sports. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if if these robots can be human-like and or even if they're not human-like, if they're able to do all the functions that a human being can, uh, it can calculate, uh, you know, the trajectory that it has to throw a free throw. It can yeah. wind everything else. In what application or is there an application that uh, when we have sports teams that are being paid uh, multi-million dollar contracts, is it more advantageous for an organization to hire a robot instead? So th there's a couple examples of the use of robots in sports. Uh, for example, as umpires in baseball, right? Uh, or in tennis, now they have, I think it's called Eagle Eye, and uh, it monitors exactly where the ball was. Was it inside the strike zone or was it outside the line in tennis, right? And, and that information is made available to the, to the umpire or to the judge. In a, um, gymnastics, a robot can actually discern the exact movement of the gymnast. Was their, was their leg perfectly stretched? Were their toes perfectly angled? Um, better than the human eye because it can capture more data points. And so there is robotic scoring or uh, human scoring with robotic um, support that is emerging. In football, they have these um, robots now, uh, tackle robots, right? So they kind of roam the field and the players tackle the robots rather than, uh, you know, somebody, some other human so you can reduce uh, the risk of injury. Um, we may see um, robotic competitions. I mean, esports has become a huge entertainment category already. And so maybe we're going to see uh, robotic races, um, different robots. Uh, I mean, just think of Robot Wars, right? A popular TV show where the robots fight against each other. Uh, maybe there's going to be skill challenges. Who can run the 400 the fastest among the bipedal robots? And people are going to watch that because now they have robots instead of humans as they're as their heroes. Could we see at some point um, human versus robot competitions? I don't know. Um, I wouldn't put it beyond, you know, sort of a soccer match of robots versus humans. It would be interesting. Um, so, yeah, again, lots of questions. Um, somebody is going to find the market niche. Somebody's going to exploit it. And, and then it'll be like it's always been there. You know, how, how did we not have esports? Uh, 20, 30 years ago, right? So it's a, it's a good point. It's another arena in which this can can make an impact. Any other questions or thoughts? I just shared a comment, Oliver, about like auto racing, you know. You know, one time horse racing was, okay, it's an example of being really good at a skill everybody had. You know, auto racing is kind of like that now, right? How well can you drive a car? As as car as cars become autonomous, will it move more to one of these sort of quaint, you know, examples of the past, like horse racing sort of is today? We still have the sport, but it's, you know, it's not a mainstream, you know, thing anymore, right? There's a few big events, the Kentucky Derby, and you know, you know what I right. mean? So. Yeah, and it's actually funny that you mention it because in Dubai, I don't know if it's horse racing or camel racing, but the jockeys are robots. The jockeys are robots. They're no longer humans racing uh, on sitting on the horses, but it's basically just robots doing it. Uh, so there you go, right? There's your there's your proof point that we're moving down that um, spectrum. All right. Well, thank you all again for being um, on the call. Um, as always, uh, this recording will be available. You can review it. You can share it with others. And uh, next time, we're going to talk about cutting edge of technology. So I'm going to take you into the world of quantum computing and DNA storage of information, things you may not have heard about. And so you can, you can sort of expand your horizon a little bit uh, further. So I look forward to seeing you again next Thursday at noon. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thanks, Bye. Oliver.